So the Tetralogy of Fallow has got four parts, hence Tetralogy, and they are easier to remember in two duologies. So um, you have got a large VSD, so you can have blood going across from one side of a heart to the other, um, and it, the, naturally you think the blood would go from left to right, but there's a, for various reasons, actually there's preferential flow in the other direction. And you have an overriding aorta with that. Now the overriding aorta, basically that means when there's a VSD, your aorta can be fed from both ventricles. Um, because uh, blood can be directly pumped across the VSD in a kind of shearing way, so it goes into the aorta. It doesn't go in from the right ventricle into the left ventricle into the aorta, it just goes from the right ventricle to the aorta. And if the aorta is positioned as such, that more than half of it is functionally above the VSD, so we draw it anat anatomically, so half of it's above the VSD, um, uh, so that basically half of it is getting blood direct from the right ventricle and that's an overriding aorta. Um, you can get more than half of it, more than half of it um, overriding, um, but for, for the purposes of this just imagine that basically some blood is going directly from the right ventricle into the aorta. Then in order to also make sure that you're getting enough blood going from the right side to the left side, and in this case right to left means right ventricle to aorta, not right ventricle to left ventricle, you need a obstruction of the normal flow. So you think about blood is a circuit, just like an electrical circuit, if you increase resistance in part of the circuit, then more of the current will preferentially go down the easier route, the route of less resistance. So here what we have is subpulmonary stenosis. Um, so uh, stenosis that occurs um, just before the pulmonary valve, to be honest, but it can be anywhere really. It just gives it a slightly different name. And that means that you've got a reduction of flow going across the pulmonary valve, an increase in resistance, um, and that is why you can have blood preferentially going into the uh, aorta. And this secondary to this, you get a right ventricular hypertrophy, and that does mean that you kind of get a uh, extrapolation of the system because you increase the pressure on the right side of the heart, and the increase in pressure on the right side of the heart means that you've got more ability to pump from right to left. But remember that it's going from the right ventricle to the aorta, not to the left ventricle. Um, this presents with low saturations because you've now got um, deoxygenated blood on the right, bypassing the lungs and going straight into the aorta, um, so that it has lower sats, and so you get a mixing of sats depending on how much um, of the aorta's supply is coming from the right ventricle rather than from the left ventricle. So if you've got 75% sats, then obviously, basically, easy way to think about it is you've essentially got 75% of your blood coming from the uh, left side rather than the right side, but that's a bit simplistic. You also get a murmur because obviously this, uh, this stenosis um, that you've got in the pulmonary area, so you get a left upper sternal edge harsh systolic murmur, which is the ejection systolic. Um, uh, it, it's like a harsh uh, aortic stenosis murmur, but obviously on, pul on the pulmonary region rather than the aortic region. We usually pick these up antenatally, but sometimes we don't, especially if children are born in countries where they don't do such in-depth antenatal scanning, and they don't have so much expertise looking at hearts. And sometimes you can pick them up in even in this country where it's a, a late diagnosis, so it, it's rare. Um, tetralogy of fallow is very common, it's the most common reason for blue baby, um, and um, if you don't pick it up early, um, then you'll have babies presenting with uh, parents noticing pallor or cyanosis and sometimes breathlessness because when you have low sats and you've got poor oxygen delivery, you do get short of breath. Um, they don't have failure to thrive. Uh, you can, if you do a chest x-ray, which is not usually a need to, the, the right-sided um, uh, ventricular hypertrophy means you get this kind of boot-shaped heart, which is different to a, uh, a TGA where you have a narrow mediastinum at the top. Um, but we very rarely actually see these, and you, you do get right-sided um, ventricular hypertrophy, as we've talked about, as part of the uh, the tetralogy, and they will often get what we call spelling. And this means once they're upset, or their heart rate goes up for some other reason, or they're dehydrated, um, then you've got a higher heart rate, and um, with the already preferential flow into the left-hand side, and with the resistance along the right-sided circulation, this means that they have very ineffective uh, stroke volume and very ineffective delivery to the lungs, so they have a pre, um, profound uh, drop in saturations. So the best way to treat this is to bring their heart rate down, and you can do that with pain relief or uh, sedation if needed. Um, you can do it by giving them a bolus um, and uh, increasing the amount of fluid that's going through their, uh, their right side of the heart, as well as 
just bringing the heart rate down due to the fact that you've treated their dehydration. And you can do that with an actual fluid bolus, or you can do it by bringing their uh, legs up to their chest or to their chin and kind of giving them a delivery of their own blood supply that's uh, trapped in their legs. Or you can give a beta blocker. And we do that IV in extremis, and then some of these babies need uh, regular beta blockers to stop them from spelling if they're having lots of spells. We generally do this repair as a one-stage repair at six months. Sometimes, if the stenosis is very bad, we need, a, we need to balloon across the pulmonary valve before that. And sometimes, if the cyanosis is really bad and there's not very much blood getting into the um, pulmonary circulation at all, you put in a BT shunt, which I'll talk about in the next slide, which, uh, which kind of alleviates that. The repair itself is basically two different things happening at once. So you, you close your VSD, and in closing your VSD, you attach your bottom of your new ventricular septum that you're forming to the aorta and basically pull the aorta across so that it's all getting uh, left ventricular uh, flow again. And then at the same time, you have to fix the pulmonary stenosis. And you do that by uh, cutting muscular um, stenosis and by uh, fixing the valve, or, um, sometimes replacing the valve if you need to. So this slide explains what a BT shunt is, and essentially what you're doing is putting in an artificial form of the uh, um, ductus arteriosus that's going to last, uh, although it will get outgrown fairly quickly. So you can use a artery to do this, but generally we use a Gore-Tex connection, and you put it between the subclavian artery and the pulmonary artery um, on one side, although we often do both sides now, um, and there's no valve in it, so there's flow going across all of the time. Um, so you get a continuous murmur. Um, anytime you need more flow to the lungs, so that can be an adduct-dependent lesion, or it can be um, as an interim measure um, before you do a more definitive operation in something like Tetralogy of Fallow, you can put it in, and it's basically like keeping the PDA open, but without having to give prostin for months and months. It's stage one in many complex cardiac con um, disease uh, operations, and we'll talk about that in the next uh, lecture. Um, and they're really quickly outgrown, so you can't leave them in for months and months because you won't have enough flow going across them. So sometimes you need to upsize them, but usually you move on to the next operation. When they're in situ, you can hear quite a loud, continuous murmur. It sounds a bit like um, ventilation or CPAP sounds, um, which is across the upper chest on whichever side the shunt is, obviously. Um, and you can also hear it on the back. It's usually as loud on the back as it is on the front. If a child is meant to have a BT shunt, for, you can tell from their history, and you listen to them and you can't hear their BT shunt, especially if they're coming in and they're somewhat sick, that's really bad and you need to escalate as quickly as possible. Because if these can, can get blocked off quite easily with clots or with infection, and then you don't have a vital part of their blood supply and these children can die very quickly. So you need to get someone involved to help try and unblock the shunt.